everybody. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director at All Brains Belong. Welcome. Welcome to our third annual presentation of Shifting the Autism Narrative. I'm going to share screen and get us oriented. Actually, because I know that so many, so many of you are new to All Brains Belong, I'll just, you know, briefly tell you who we are. So we're a nonprofit, we're a toddler nonprofit, we're just over two years old, um, trying to make life better for people with all types of brains. And uh, we do this by reimagining healthcare, employment, and so many other broken systems that are not working for neurodivergent people. So if, uh, before, actually, before, before I tell you any more, <laughs> closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot, 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 and choose show subtitles. You can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. So if this is your first ABB event, welcome. We begin all of our events with a community agreement, tattling like what, what we can expect and how we're going to be in space together. So all forms of participation are okay. As many of you have figured out, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to sit still or like make eye contact with the camera or anything like that. So please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or whatever else needs doing. Um, uh, welcome back to our, our uh, Brain Club regulars. So tonight's webinar is taking, uh, it's in the slot of another program that we run weekly. So I just wanted to name that the format of tonight is different from a regular Brain Club. I have a ton of content that will take up most of this hour. And so we invite you to use the chat to ask questions as we go and the ABB team will respond to questions as we go. Um, you're also welcome to send private messages or questions to the All Brains Belong team, and you'll see um, their, their display names, their Zoom display names will indicate if they are part of our staff. We may have a few minutes at the end to ask questions using math words. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make today safe for all participants, we prioritize the group's needs over that of the individual. And so one of the ways we typically do that is uh, that we kind of like tread lightly or cautiously around sensitive topics. However, tonight there are a lot of these. So I want to give a content warning that this talk, this whole talk is about very distressing topics. Content warning for terrifying health data, distress, trauma, death, suicide, applied behavioral analysis, and systemic ableism. And so we begin. First, about me. I'm a family physician. I care for toddlers through older adults. Uh, for the past eight years or so, my clinical focus has been that of supporting neurodivergent kids and adults, often multi-generational families. And though I have a bunch of professional training in that regard, what I have to learn the most about is through parenting. I'm partial to say that I'm uh, the student of the world's wisest seven-year-old who has taught me more about brains than any of my professional training, really. I'm also autistic, and I spend most of my day and my life with autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people. I do not speak for anyone else except myself. I will present research and data on collective experiences, um, but autistic people, we're all different. So I wanted to name that. I'm invested in the long game, the long game where my sweet little love and all the sweet little loves can grow up in a world where everyone can belong and show up as their true selves. And so I, I spend a lot of my time kind of like working as a, a cultural broker of sorts really trying to bridge the double empathy problem. The double empathy problem is a term that was coined by an autistic social scientist, Dr. Damian Milton um, in the UK. And uh, Dr. Milton found in research that miscommunication happens 
when there is a mismatch of worldview um, and communication style between neurotypes. Um, so for example, we know that tonight uh, we have a audience as a mixture of autistic people, um, friends and family of autistic people and professionals looking to learn more. So I walk an often fine line um, in adapting my communication to be well received by different audiences. And so I often take like an indirect or an oblique angle, but not tonight. The thing is uh, the, the research and the history and even the current events presented this evening may be quite distressing and particularly for the professionals in the audience for whom this may run so counter to your training and professional culture. Um, but I just wanted to prepare all of us, myself included, to expect discomfort. And so do whatever needs doing to take care of yourself, including taking breaks, shutting off your sound, whatever strategies you use to regulate. For me, I don't like talking about this stuff either, um, but I remember the long game where again, all people with all types of brains can show up in community and live authentic lives. So honestly, that's why I give this presentation every April, um, but why April? So as many of you may know, um, April is Autism Awareness Month or Autism Acceptance Month or, or, or all that. This may be new information for non-autistic audience members, but April's really hard for, for a lot of autistic people. Um, you know, it can be hard to be bombarded with messages about how society should accept you, um, you know, without any real change to the systems that continue to harm autistic people. So that's why we give this presentation every April. This is the third time we're doing this. When I do trainings for healthcare professionals, um, I, I ask this question, what comes to mind when you think of autism and the autistic people you know? And, and honestly, what comes back at me is fairly predictable. It's, it's really repeating back to me DSM criteria. So that's why three years ago, we decided to start doing this talk because I think um, there is so much more to autism than DSM criteria. So we're gonna take a look at the status quo of healthcare for autistic people. And then we're gonna like rewind and we're gonna look at the history of how the medical model and medical narrative of autism was, was actually written. And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how do we shift the paradigm. So my medical education about autism looked something like this. Um, first, uh, in my first couple of years of medical school, I had a one hour lecture. It focused on, you know, the, the triad of impairments, deficit with, uh, and a rote list of co-occurring medical conditions without necessarily any framework for connecting them. And then when I got out into clinical rotations, um, that those triad of impairments, those stereotypes, that's what I saw. And there was an emphasis on red flags, preventing, treating, you know, it was like strongly implied that this is something you wanna avoid having or being. There was also a hidden curriculum. Messages sent that there was one like correct linear way to develop, to play, to learn, to essentially be a person. We know of course that that's not true. Here's a picture of me on the left, uh, a week before I became a parent. So there I am, I'm a doctor who takes care of babies. I thought I knew what I was doing. Yeah, my baby thought otherwise and let me know in no uncertain terms that their little baby access needs were being thwarted. The world was too bright, too loud, moved way too quickly. And they let me know in no uncertain terms that my medical training was profoundly inadequate to meet their needs. They let me know, of course, by screaming all of their waking hours in their first two years of life. And though I think um, uh, there, there, are cer there certainly are um, 
people of all ages who spend all their waking hours screaming. Um, there, there are also people who are screaming on the inside. And I think that it's really important for professionals to know that, that autistic people, both um, in, in, in my professional experience and interacting with people and literature tells us that the majority of autistic people are dissatisfied with their health care and feel unsafe in healthcare scenarios. That's a problem. What we know is that autistic adults have poor access to health care. About 80% have difficulty accessing primary care among people who have established with a primary care practice already. So it's not like, oh, I got to find a practice that takes a new patient. No, they have a practice and they can't access care. So not surprisingly, um, about 70% have untreated health conditions. Healthcare relationships suffer. Only about a third of autistic adults uh, reported having a good relationship with their primary care physician, despite more than 70% like wanting one. And uh, just over a third of people don't even tell their PCP that they're autistic, specifically because of fear of judgment. And professionals don't feel good about this either. So we know from research that there are three main buckets of barriers to care um, relating to the healthcare environment, related to sensory processing and communication mismatches. Related to the provider with autistic adults in these studies re reporting that they perceive that their healthcare provider has insufficient knowledge and skills to take care of them and that they harbor unhelpful attitudes. And the system, systemic barriers. There are so many defaults in the healthcare system. And, and you know, you must pick up the phone to make an appointment. You must fill out the 20 page packet to become a new patient, right? So anytime there's a default, one way of doing the thing, anyone whose brain works differently than that is othered. And I mentioned earlier that the hidden curriculum, the hidden curriculum for trainees about, you know, this is the one right way to show up as a patient. Um, I remember as a medical student, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, it was uh, modeled for me um, by my supervisors. Um, you know, here we go, it's another patient with a list. As though there were anything wrong with organizing your thoughts in writing ahead of time before an appointment. That's not why we're talking about this. We're talking about this because autistic patients are dying. The average life expectancy for an autistic person is 36 to 54 years. Not dying from autism, dying from premature cardiovascular disease and suicide, with autistic adults having a four to nine times increased risk of completed suicide. And those rates are higher in those with lower support needs. And it has been found that camouflaging, masking, um, increases the risk of dying by suicide. It is my professional opinion that any interventions that are framed around an autistic person needing to cover up their autistic selves is bad for health. When I learned that, it was a hard stop. I found it profoundly unacceptable. I was 37 and had just learned that I'm autistic. I was then also the parent of a, a, a then four-year-old autistic child. Why was nobody talking about this? Why did nobody know this? So I decided to quit my perfectly stable job and start a nonprofit to try to do something about this so that my child could grow up in a world where autistic people don't die in the prime of our lives.
Let's take a look at the healthcare narrative of autism. Um, about six or seven years ago, I asked families of my patients, um, my child patients, um, what do they remember about what doctors said to them when their children were diagnosed as autistic? And here's some of the things they shared. I'm so sorry to tell you this, but I think he has autism. Or don't worry, he doesn't have autism, as though there were something to be worried about. She can't be autistic, she makes eye contact. Besides, why would it matter anyway? Um, or more recently, a family in the All Brains Belong community shared that when her child was diagnosed, the doctor handed her a box of tissues. Video um, that comes from uh, uh, this, this article, How to Deliver a Diagnosis of an Autism Spectrum Disorder to Parents. I have to reshare with sound. Many parents have questions about the autism diagnosis and what it means. Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, is characterized by social interaction difficulties, communication challenges, and a tendency to engage in repetitive behaviors. However, symptoms and their severity vary widely across these three core areas. Taken together, they may result in relatively mild challenges for someone on the high-functioning end of autism spectrum. For others, symptoms may be more severe, as when repetitive behaviors and lack of spoken language interfere with everyday life. And while autism is usually a lifelong condition, all children and adults benefit from interventions or therapies that can reduce symptoms and increase skills and abilities. Although it is best to begin intervention as soon as possible, the benefits of therapy can continue throughout life. So what's implied in this video, to me, is that autism is a problem and that it would be better to not have it or be it. It's also implied that a good outcome would be for a person to not appear autistic. Just think about that. So as the parent of an autistic child, who at the time did not yet know that I was autistic, um, you know, I realized that the way I was trained was really interfering with me becoming the parent that I wanted to be. Um, the medical model of autism was, was not compatible with, with this new culture that I was learning about. You know, I, I recognized, uh, you know, a major gap in, in my own knowledge and skills and attitudes. And so I tried to learn, I started learning about autism from autistic people, not knowing, again, that I was one. So I read books and blogs and vlogs, you know, anything I could really get my hands on from autistic content creators. This was not the story that I'd been taught in medical school. How could this be? How could the healthcare system, like the medical education system, how could it, how could it be so, how could it get it so wrong? So I um, decided to learn about the history of the medical model of autism. Because I, I think that the way healthcare professionals think about and talk about autism perpetuates the stigma of autism. And yet the details that I am about to share are not part of medical training. Had they been, I would like to think that I would have been skeptical about what I was fed. So here goes. 
the autism narrative was formed by a stereotype that was created in the early to mid 1900s and perpetuated. The word autism was first used by a Swiss psychologist, Eugene Bueller, who's actually describing symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, he's describing patients who were especially withdrawn and self-absorbed and uh, electroconvulsive therapy was used to treat Bueller's patients. In 1943, an American psychologist, Dr. Leo Kanner, published a paper describing 11 children who lacked social instinct to orient to other people, were focused and even obsessed with objects, and had, quote, an obsessive insistent on persistent sameness. He named their condition early infantile autism. This restricted view would actually shape the narrative that we like still have 81 years later. Meanwhile, turns out a few years prior to that, Kanner had hired a diagnostician named George Frankel who had come from Germany. Prior to working with Kanner, this guy Frankel had been the chief diagnostician in another scientist lab, Hans Asperger. Asperger, who had been writing about similar patients in the late 1930s, is now thought to be the original first person to describe autism. In 1944, he published um, a description of a, quote, milder form. They were all boys in, in, in his description who were highly intelligent, but struggled with social interactions and had specific obsessive interests. Uh, more recently, of course, it has been identified that actually Asperger had done surgery on these children's brains and had opportunistically referred some of these tiny children to Nazi eugenics programs. By the way, that's why we don't use the term Asperger's or Asperger's anymore. Now, meanwhile, in the 1940s and 50s, there was another character named Bruno Bettelheim, originally thought to be a psychologist, but turns out he actually had fraudulent records and um, wasn't actually a psychologist, but he rose to fame. Bettelheim wrote articles and made TV appearances promoting his view that children with autism experienced horrors at home similar to prisoners in Nazi concentration camps and that autism was a trauma response to the term he coined as refrigerator mothers. He and Kanner propagated the idea that these children should be um, institutionalized quote, for their own good. This was literally called a parentectomy, the removal of the parent. Kanner himself wrote that these children were exposed from the beginning to parental coldness left neatly in refrigerators that these, um, that from which they did not defrost. Their withdrawal seems to be an act of turning away from such a situation to seek comfort in solitude. In a 1960 interview, Kanner bluntly described parents of autistic children as, quote, just happened to defrost enough to produce a child. As all of this was going on, there was an emerging trend that this awful thing called autism needed to be treated. The U.S. National Autism Society was founded in the 1960s and became a multi-billion dollar industry named on curing this horrible condition caused by the refrigerator mothers. In addition to antipsychotics being developed to sedate these dysregulated tiny humans, behavioral treatments rose to power. Ivar Lovas, the same UCLA researcher who developed the appalling technique of gay conversion therapy, developed a therapy program called Applied Behavioral Analysis, which consisted of aversive punishment to extinguish autistic behavior and reinforce the gold standard of the default neuronormative behavior. Lovas is quoted as saying, when you work with an autistic person, you start from scratch. 
you have a person in that they're people in the physical sense. They have hair, a nose, mouth, but they're not psychologically a person. This is a matter of constructing a person. You have the raw materials. You just have to build the person. And in this setting, autism entered the DSM. And though um, when autism first entered the DSM in the 1980s, certainly there have been some like revisions in the subsequent iterations of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, but look at the way autism is first um, described in DSM-3 in 1980. Lack of social interest, severe communication impairment, bizarre response to the environment. So really, that's not that different from what is described today. Of course, um, what I would also mention is that the behavioral modification technology um, that was developed in the 1960s and 70s, while present day applied behavioral analysis um, does not usually involve aversive punishments. I want to bring this to your attention. The Judge Rottenberg Center is a day school for children with developmental disabilities in Canton, Massachusetts. The Judge Rottenberg Center is an ABA center that uses ABA with aversives, including restraint, seclusion, food deprivation, and use of electric shocks to alter behavior. Electric shocks to humans the use of these devices was condemned by the United Nations and banned by the FDA. Despite this, the Judge Rottenberg Center continues to use shock devices on humans today and attempts over the past 20 plus years to shut this down have been thwarted both by because of powerful lobbying by the Judge Rottenberg Center itself and protests from parents, parents who say, this is the only thing that works. And so a call to action, the FDA is taking public comment. What do you think about use of shocks on humans? And that public comment is open now through May 28th. And uh, the ABB team will put a link in the chat to get some guidance on like how, to, how, do you, how do you even make a public comment to the FDA and what might you say and how do you do it and where do you put it? So please look into this. This is a human, this is a major human rights problem. So Meanwhile, um, as I was saying, um, autism enters the DSM um, because of the work of like Canner and Bettelheim, who I told you about before. Um, and, and, and Bettelheim, of course, was later like debunked as not even being a psychologist. And even as like some of the words changed over time in DSM, the deficit based lens did not. And it still has not. Um, this is a, an excerpt from an autism evaluation report um, shared with permission from a family in our community. This seven-year-old does not clinically have the separate, inwardly focused quality pathognomonic of the disorder. He interacts significantly and seamlessly with parents and demonstrates empathy. Rapport is present. Ergo, the sweet little love is not autistic. Yep, hasn't changed that much at all. And the thing is, when you're only trained in stereotypes as a professional, that's all you see. 
Um, this study out of Kaiser, uh, Zerbo et al. in 2015, found that less than 10% of primary care physicians would suspect that their patient were autistic if they volunteered information, showed interest in people, discusses emotions, or could see the whole picture. Yep. know is that there are many members of our community that when they hear some of the, the language, these terms that get thrown around, and you heard it in the video I played you, use of functioning labels, for example, these terms that they, they actually reflect quite poorly on the professional. Um, they make many people feel unsafe because they suggest that that professional using that term is operating in this type of paradigm. Why this matters is that autistic people grow up stigmatized and othered. We get the message directly and indirectly that our way of thinking, behaving, communicating is fundamentally wrong, broken, and needs changing. So the, the words people use influences the way they see the world, and I think vice versa. And so if healthcare providers are actually viewing our patients through the lens of Canner and Asperger and Bettelheim and Lovas, how on earth will they ever feel safe with us? How will they ever feel comfortable? The thing is, it doesn't have to stay this way. Let's talk about shifting the narrative. What we know in 2022, when I first started giving this talk, um, and we still know it in 2024, um, is that we all have different brains. We all have different ways of taking in information through our senses, processing, thinking, behaving, communicating, learning. We all have unique patterns of strengths and challenges. Does that mean that everyone is autistic? No, that is not true. And so when you hear someone say something like, well, everyone's a little autistic. No, not everyone is a little autistic. But neurodiversity refers to the big continuum of the different ways that brains do things. And the neurodiversity paradigm is that there's not one right type of correct brain. Um, when we think about neurodivergence, we are talking about the at least one in five people whose brains learn, think, and or communicate differently than uh, the, the type of brain that society caters to, the type of brain that, um, that society has deemed normative but we all have different brains, which is why universal design, which is offering everything you do in multiple different ways is best practice. Short of this, it's about designing supports and accommodations. It's not about treating or fixing or forcing people to comply with defaults. So let's look at autism defined in the neurodiversity paradigm. McCowan et al. Um, a group of autistic physicians and researchers define autism as a lifelong difference in how people communicate and interact with the world. These differences lead to strengths and challenges with inter individual profiles, which include special interests, hyperfocus, other sensory differences, and anxiety. Rachel Dorsey, an autistic speech language pathologist, defines autism as a neurologically based difference that results in a different culture of communication. Kieran Rose, an autistic educator and researcher, defines autism as a neurologically based difference in thinking, feeling, and being. This relates to how the brain takes in, processes, and organizes this information and interacts with the environment and other people. ASM-5 lists autistic stress behaviors. Rather than define a group of people by what they look like when they're stressed and dysregulated, we actually know a lot more about the autistic neurotype. Autistic brains 
are pattern matchers, system thinkers. In fact, um, uh, many of us derive safety from predictable systems. So of course we become dysregulated when those predictable systems are violated. Anybody becomes dysregulated when they feel unsafe. Executive functioning differences. Autistic brains are monotropic. That is, fewer things captivate our interest and do so more intensely than other brains. We tend toward hyper-focus, that a narrow attentional tunnel on a thing. And um, we tend toward inertia. Inertia, um, an object in motion stays in motion. I start doing the thing and now I can't stop doing the thing. And or the object cannot start moving. So I can't get out of bed in the morning. I can't initiate that terrible thing. Um, executive function differences. Social communication. Many of us, uh, we collect details, you know, from conversations, from movies, from songs. Um, and our language reflects the, a lot of the snippets that we store. I, I, uh, I, I tend to say the same things over and over again, or the same ways of describing things they become automatic speech, which actually costs less brain battery to me. Autistic people often also communicate what they mean and mean what they communicate. Not all brains do that all the time. We're often, um, often more comfortable parallel playing at all ages. And because we're monotropic, we connect with people who share our interest. Motor coordination. 86.9% of us have um, motor planning and sequencing challenges, which impact how we move our bodies, how we um, sequence our ideas, how we communicate, pretty much everything. This is, um, you know, this isn't even in the DSM criteria. This is like an essential part of understanding autistic brains. And sensory processing, of course, our sensory systems. We take in way more information than other brains. And sometimes this results in, in overwhelm, chaos, pain, sometimes joy. Plus, there's autistic culture. Maisie Sotanto and Matt Lowry define autistic culture as the way we live, imagine, think, communicate, create, express joy, move and connect with others. This plays out in all kinds of ways from how we communicate, how we process information to how our attentional systems operate, what our play looks like, what our consumption of food looks like. So this, this is the real deal. These five buckets. Behind the scenes, all of this is going on sensory processing, executive functioning, motor planning and sequencing. And um, uh, when, since most of us spend most of our time in environments that don't meet our needs, our battery is getting drained constantly. And what happens when your demands chronically exceed your capacity. Autistic burnout, that's what happens. Having all your internal resources exhausted beyond measure and being left with no cleanup crew. It's the title of this article. Maybe uh, Lizzie, if you can pop that link in the chat, I think that article is a really good one. Many late identified or late diagnosed autistic adults come to their realization of their neurotype in the context of autistic burnout. That's how I got my autism diagnosis. What would it be like for people to understand how their brains work and what their needs are without having to be 
brought to this extent. Don't want, we don't want the square peg being hammered to fit into the round hole. But that's what happens, right? And what happens, we break the peg. And so many people are being shoved into containers that don't work for them. This is really bad for health. And so um, I'll tell you more about All Brains Belong in a minute, but um, we have a community advisory board that informs all of our programs and priorities. And a couple of years ago, we asked, well, how will we know that our community has become more neuroinclusive? And what so many people talked about was access needs. Access needs being anything required for meaningful and full participation in one's environment or community. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. It's just that depending on, you know, how much agency, how much privilege, how much autonomy someone has, um, your environment may more or less be a mismatch for your needs. And there's all different types of, of access needs, physical, emotional, communication, social technology, all different types of access needs. And that framework can be a really important way of, of understanding. And though we don't have, a, we don't have any time today to go into details, I do wanna introduce you to some resources created um, from autistic content creators. Um, and uh, my and, and if the AVB team can pop these links in the chat as we go, um, these are some really awesome podcasts that talk about autistic experiences in everyday life. And um, uh, All Brains Belongs community program Brain Club that usually runs in this Tuesday in six uh, six p.m. slot. We do a book chat um, at the at the last week of every month, and these are some past Brain Club book chats by autistic authors, um, including what we'll be discussing in two weeks from now, um, Autistic and Black. Okay, so wrapping up building a community where all brains belong. Here is reimagine all of these broken systems. Um, you know, because we know the healthcare system's broken, doesn't work for a lot of people. And as I've tried to share with you, for some people it doesn't work for, it can mean the difference between life and death. And to think that it always has to be like that, it's just a failure of imagination. So instead of thinking like, we gotta keep doing the thing the way it's done, um, we thought about how else could healthcare look? So we've intentionally created this model where healthcare is more than medical care, where we integrate medical care into social connection, employment support, helping people to arrive at a deep understanding of their access needs, training the surrounding community um, to celebrate the strengths of people with all types of brains and create environments where people with all types of brains can get their needs met and thrive. We try to offer everything we do in multiple different ways using universal design principles and community connection through all of this is a core focus of what we do. Because we know um, that not only do autistic people experience higher rates of social isolation and loneliness, we know that for all comers, social isolation and loneliness um, have the equivalent harm on health as smoking 15 cigarettes per day. Loneliness is bad for health. So how do we do this? Um, we designed our programs informed by like first looking to the literature, um, including and really centering, not just including, but centering contributions by um, autistic researchers. Um, so um, uh, the work of Autistic Doctors International, the Aspire group, um, you know, what's already known about the barriers to healthcare access for autistic people, um, much of which I have shared with you already today. And um, uh, I think the, the big thing is this like place-based 
um, centering of our local community. So, you know, we are looking at the health of our community by, by, by trying to hold space to know what the community's needs are. So, you know, we ask people what they want and we try to do those things, you know, if, if possible. And we ask them what stresses them out and we try to not do those things. You know, we, we, we try, I think because we're serving, you know, kids, adults, families, we're, we're serving people whose needs have not been met by the traditional healthcare system, you know, mostly. Um, you know, they felt dismissed invalidated, misunderstood. So they come here and they connect, not just with us, you know, hopefully they feel connected to us, but, but they connect with each other. That's, that's where the, that's, that's really what we're doing differently, right? So they connect with other people and they now belong to a community. For many people, they, for the first time are able to show up authentically as their true selves. This improves health. So, you know, together, together with our uh, circle of supporters, we've built a community health village of learning and healing together where people can show up, um, you know, as their true selves with people who get it. And, and in so doing, they transform their own lives because they shift their own lens of how they see themselves. I think because when many people hear their own stories reflected back to them through the lens of other people, how, how could they not feel less alone? And what that allows is it allows for the building of trust in community for people who have not felt safe connecting with a community before. And when, when you build trust in community, you can imagine the future, future together, future with hope. Because now they know what's possible. So um, I'm gonna quickly try to uh, uh, share with you four themes of what we've learned in our first two years. Theme one, healthcare is more than medical care. Um, neurodivergent people struggle in, in, in so many different domains of life. And when I was in a traditional primary care practice, um, I was spending like all my time in the exam room trying to help people problem solve life outside the exam room. Um, you know, if, 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 if I, if I struggle to make friends, if I struggle to access my education, if I struggle to hold a job, that's part of health. Why is health thought of as so separate from the rest of life? So our social connection programs, which by the way, are open to everyone, even people who don't get their health care here, um, uh, are, are, are a core part of what we do. So this is an example, Kid Connections. It's a customized friend matching program. It was actually um, thought of by a child, um, an eight-year-old on our junior advisory board. I asked them two years ago, I said, now, how do you think we can help kids feel like they belong? And without any hesitation, the sweet little love says, you let us do what we love. It's not that hard to help people feel like they belong. This is a quote from a 16 year old participant in the program. Their parents sent us an email um, where they said that their child said, so this must be what it feels like to finally have a friend. Or there's Brain Club. Um, Brain Club, which uh, meets, meets every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern, right in this very time slot, um, uh, has been going on for the past uh, two and a half years. Um, it's the idea, uh, it's a community education program about everyday brain life. And every month has a different theme and every week has a different topic within the theme. Um, it's about bringing people together based on a shared vision of what's, of, of what's possible. And um, by like developing shared language and new ways of thinking, new ways of, of, of being, it's really shifting culture, it's shifting social norms. Um, if you can feel it in brain flow, then you go out into the rest of your life 
Um, and 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 uh, we think that's that's how these changes, how this narrative starts to shift. Theme number two, there's no one right way to think, learn, or communicate. Um, uh, whether it is in our community programs, in our statewide COVID vaccination clinics, in our medical practice, um, we offer everything we do in multiple different ways. Um, these video, Lindsay, I think I'm going to take a chance and play a video and just reshare the sound button. They're short. I think we can do it. I am very afraid of needles. I have been my entire life because my veins roll and nurses would have to hold me down. And I think that that's why I'm afraid of needles. But it came to our attention that there were many people, kids and adults, who were unable to access vaccination because of healthcare trauma, like bad experiences in the past, needle phobia, anxiety, sensory processing differences, like in the usual cases or settings in which vaccination occurs. And my own five-year-old, I was like, there is no way that my sweet little love is going to be able to access COVID vaccination, like at a big loud facility. Like there's just no way that was happening. So I thought it would be, and it was, um, a, a really cool opportunity to demonstrate universal design, giving, uh, giving lots of different choices to people not because people disclosed any disabilities and requested accommodations, um, but because it was offered to all people. So um, people with all types of brains, open to anyone who thought that they would benefit, kids or adults, you got to co-create an experience. So you got to pick whether you wanted a brightly lit space or a dimly lit space. You picked your furniture. You told us what made what what, what brought you joy. You told us what uh, what stressed you out, so that we could make sure to avoid it. You're literally going to have a completely different nervous system experience. The vaccine mm -hmm. clinic is the first va vaccination I've had that was actually pleasant, which is you don't really think of vaccinations as being pleasant. It made something so horrible into something wonderful. I got a chance to talk about what I liked. And I, and I was 19 when this happened, so it's not just for kids either. It was a wonderful experience, and it's just one of the many wonderful things that All Brains Belong does. When you think about your experience trying to access health, So what you what you heard there, those examples of you know what we offer in a vaccine clinic, that's what we do in our medical practice. All of our patients are offered um, the opportunity to co-create an experience because one size fits all does not work for all. I get to see people come in who haven't been able to get care anywhere else. Do you want bright lights, low lights, fidget toys? Um, do you want to have time check-ins? Do you want to have summaries sent? These things are an option? What? What interests me about All Brains Belong is the idea of a customizable menu to make an experience, whether it's a vaccine clinic or a medical visit in the office or a community gathering event, feel good to each unique individual. Being able to cue safety and adapt the environment for what people need. And what do you mean healthcare can be like this? Again, it's not that hard to help people feel like they belong. If we shifted the narrative so that all kids grow up knowing that some brains do it this way, some brains do it that way, and that there is no one right way to do things.
Theme number three, ask the community what they need. Um, you know, when we think about systems change, unless we talk about like top down, you know, when you take these big changes and get these big systems to make these big changes, that, I mean, that's really important, um, but I don't like, that takes too long. Um, if you if if you start small and you ask your community what they need and you try to do it, like that's that's like grassroots system change from the ground up. And so, you know, when we asked our community what they needed, we 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 were able to do really most most of those things. And along the way, several times a year, we asked them again and we asked them systematically so that we can continue to be flexible and responsive to their needs. Um, uh, uh, for for example, um, by by bringing people together as this community village, um, we have been able to make a huge, um, like I think, a huge leap um, than we would have been able to do without um, without our patients. Um, and so, what we found really very early, it was very clear that amongst um, a patient population of mostly autistic and ADHD patients, not all of our patients, um, you know, would identify as neurodivergent or are neurodivergent, um, but, 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 but most, most are 90% are. And amongst that group of neurodivergent people whose needs were not met by the traditional healthcare system, so it's like a more and more self-selected group, they were more likely to suffer from a particular pattern a constellation of intertwined medical conditions involving multiple systems of the body that aren't well understood by the traditional healthcare system. Um, this constellation of intertwined medical problems for which sometimes the standard medical management of some parts of this cluster make the other parts worse. For example, if uh, you have chronic pain and a doctor prescribes you a muscle relaxant um, and you actually had a connective tissue disorder that you didn't know about, well, now your floppy connective tissue got floppier, including um, in your airway, where? Because your sleep disorder that you didn't know about, um, your floppy airway actually made your sleep disorder worse, which made your autonomic nervous system um, uh, more dysregulated, which made your pain worse. So when you, when you like fragment out the body parts, this and, and the healthcare system drives that the healthcare system by like you know making clinicians like have to operate in this 15 minute visit thing like 10 10, minute, 10 to 15 minute visit thing like that really interferes with clinicians being able to see the big picture all at once and so um together with our patients we co-created this resource that's freely available on our website called the Everything's Connected to Everything Project with support from the Organization on Autism Research and HRSA. Um, there's patient education materials, there is clinician education materials, and um, my favorite part, there's a letter that a patient can print out, bring it to their next appointment with their primary care clinician and let the letter speak for you. It directly bridges the double empathy problem by using the language that primary care clinicians are used to receiving. Um, the other way, uh, the other, other major um, thing that we've started doing in the past year or so, um, because our patients asked us to, our patients asked us to train the community. They asked us to train other healthcare providers. They asked us to train employers. Um, and so, you know, we wouldn't have even thought to do that um, without our community asking us to start doing that. Because, you know, we can create this little microcosm where people get their needs met, but then out in the rest of the world, they have to get their needs met there too. And that's that's the paradigm shift. And so we talk about neural inclusion. How do you create environments, um, spaces where people with all types of brains can get their needs met and thrive? Not a set of you know practices, things you do special for this group of people, but like, how do you just offer things in multiple different ways? And how do you have a lens of just knowing that we all have different brains and different brains have different needs? And then lastly, of course, connection is the path to health. So, you know, while we are, we've been able to innovate new ways of delivering healthcare in this broken healthcare system, 
But because of the broken economic system, many of our community members are still struggling to access care. And, you know, at All Brains Belong, we, we think that healthcare is a human right and that everyone deserves healthcare. Two years ago, our community advisory board um, created the All Brains Belong Medical Assistance Fund with the idea of the community taking care of itself. This quote um, from its founding um, member, um, I wanna make sure that people keep reaching out to get their needs met without guilt or shame. I would love to set a precedent of this community supporting itself and taking care of one another. So we need your help to do that. If you have capacity and you would like to support the All Brains Belong Medical Assistance Fund, um, we are pretty close to being able to wipe out the medical debt of our autistic patients who can't get care anywhere else. If you have capacity to help us, we would greatly appreciate that. And so as we wrap up, belonging. I'm gonna play a video, one more video. an opportunity to meet others in the community who are going through the same or similar things, um, which then gives you know, us the opportunity to learn from each other's experiences and to really value and feel valued by each other and feel a lot less alone and a lot more hopeful. Um, and so it ends up feeling like a community more than a medical practice. What I often see is once people feel safe and once people have been cued safety, they're able to engage in community. And that's when we really see these kind of healthcare jumps for people. Um, we see, you know, people come to group visits and learn from other people and have that shame reduction of, oh, it's not just me dealing with all these things. Um, there's other people who believe me, there's other people who are like me um, and get really quality medical care too. To be in a community where I get to explore and learn about my brain and other people and other people's brains. We're all in this together as individuals that, you know, that sees things differently, hears things differently, moves things differently. Smoothing out the rough edges of my experiences and of my perceptions. I'm less harsh on myself. I'm less sharp with myself. Right? It's exposing me to people being so beautifully raw and authentic because the space allows that. And I can't think of many spaces in life that allow for people to, um, to come together in this way and kind of like this radical act of trust. ABB to me has been a way to have community, have social connections, to understand my body, to reframe mental illness into, you know, autism, to, to medicines that, you know, simple medicines that have been able to make my mobility and my um, ability to be in the world different. ABB has given me a way to be myself and in community with others um, that I hadn't had in so long. What do you mean healthcare can be like this? Um, and so with that, um, you know, this is about building a relationship. Um, you know, if there's anything you heard tonight that resonated with you, we'd love for you to stay connected with us and, you know, continue to stay involved with our, with our programs, um, sign up for our, our monthly newsletter where we send out free events and stuff and social media. And there's a you know a couple other things on this on this on this website different ways of just different ways of participating and staying connected. So um, with that, I'm happy to take a couple questions. Enoch. Hello. Thank you for this presentation. It was actually quite wonderful. Um, even though there were some tough subjects being covered. This is all part of the work that I do. I'm not a medical professional, but 
I got my diagnosis about 12 years ago on my 25th birthday. And over the last year and a half, I've been working to build a company to address things on the employment side and to help people with unmasking. Um, because like you said, there's so much trauma that comes from the repetitive masking and it really is an addiction the way i see it it's a social addiction in the same way that people can be addicted to you know substances which very often comes from masking with substances um yeah. there's that yeah. bigger issue and i i'm out in la um so other side of the country entirely but I would love to connect with you directly on LinkedIn and um, to set up a time where we can talk because I've been wanting to get more community things going. And that's not yeah. where my Thanks, executive Nina. function lies. Yeah, so, that's, that's, th thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. I would say about masking is that um, uh, the, the, the way I see masking is that it's a survival strategy. And so there are many community members who it's simply not safe to unmask. Um, Sierra. I was actually gonna reiterate what you said, Mel, um, about masking and just how, um, yeah, how, how important of it is of a um, safety strategy and how it's, it's, it's unconscious and not always controllable by a lot of people. Um, and that's, I think that's really, that's a really big part of the picture here. Jennifer. Hi. Um, so I'm also not in Vermont. I'm uh, across the country, but I found out about you through my daughter who is in Vermont and a patient there and says great things. Um, I work for a nonprofit myself and I was curious. Uh, so you've created this amazing model here is there, has there been any interest or people approaching you about recreating this model in other states? Because I'm, I need this here. And I imagine, you know, everybody in every state dealing with, um, or who, who is autistic and dealing with related health issues, we're so desperate for things like this. Thank you for the question, Jennifer. And you know, there's so many people, so many people suffering. Um, you know, we we offer trainings. We are happy to teach healthcare providers to do what we do. Um, uh, uh, and 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 we have like free resources on our website. Um, you know, free because I I think when we think about neuro inclusive healthcare, at least. When I think about neuroinclusive healthcare, think about the knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So we talked about attitudes tonight, um, but the knowledge is also missing. So this constellation of intertwined medical problems. Remember, like that whole dying age thirty six to fifty four. Like the medical problems are not known by the. They're, they're just not. They're not part of medical education. So anyway, it's for free. We made a thing, we put it on the website. It's there and it's free and it's available. And we're happy to train people to use it if they want us to, but it's also just free. Um, but, but that resource was also about empowering patients, putting the power back in the hands of the people. Because if you look at that clinician guide, there's a lot of things that, um, there's, a lot of, there, there's, there, there's, there's a lot of things patients can do um, even, even without, access to someone who already knows about this and some of the tools in that project can actually help a patient work with their current clinician, their current primary care clinician, like to work through these things together. It doesn't need to be an area of expertise already, as long as you have, you know, people, you know, a, 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 a therapeutic relationship. Sarah. 
Yeah, that kind of goes along with what I was thinking about. Um, I was thinking about this stigma talk that you gave last year and um, the idea of kind of like um, where to begin with um, becoming a more neuroinclusive space. Like if somebody is looking to figure out how to make their place of employment or healthcare setting more neuroinclusive, like what might be the first step that you would advise people in? Mm -hmm. Oh, you cut out. Yeah. So, what a great question. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I would say, I would say, I mean, this is whether it's healthcare or you know your place of employment or school. Like, it, I mean, I, I I would answer the same in any type of organization. Um, that like try to stomp out your defaults. Um, so the idea of thinking through the workflow of the people, the person you're serving as they interface with your organization, um, and along the way, um, are there any places where you're only offering things in one way? And if you can introduce one, ideally two other options, that is going to take you leaps and bounds, you know, uh, toward, toward improving neuro inclusion. Kit and then Martha. Uh -oh. Sorry, I was just noticing, like, I had a comment that showed up that I didn't write. Um, but, I, th I think there's multiple kits. That's oh, all. maybe there's multiple. Oh, yeah. there's a they, them, and a she, they. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, hi, other kit. Um, so I have a child who has been given a constellation of diagnoses um, and is PDA and, um, you know, at this point is able to receive services as a result of those diagnoses. And I guess my question is in the context of the system as a whole, sorry. My kids, right? Um, what your thoughts are on the value of pursuing an autism diagnosis? I think, based on my own experiences um, and the trauma that I've gone through throughout my life, um, as a result of my needs being misidentified, misrepresented, or mistreated. Um, I have a lot of fears about pursuing a similar diagnosis for my child at this point in time. And I just, I wonder what your thoughts are just kind of in reflecting on everything that you've shared here today is, is this something, is there a necessity to pursue this as far as their health needs um, outside of my own awareness of, of their needs and, and um, the ability for them to get support in, in school and from Thank you, Kit. What a great question. So I would say that what is um, well described in the literature and is certainly the experience of my, the majority of my late identified autistic adult patients, like who didn't learn that they were autistic until adulthood, um, the, 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 the experience is that they always felt different. And when a narrative is not provided to sweet little loves, they make one up. And what they tend to make up is I'm broken, I'm defective. So if you can have a strengths-based lens to identify like, this is how my brain works, that is, something that might be quite helpful. You know, the decision to um, pursue evaluation or not is not as simple as like, do you think it would be helpful if my autistic child knew that they were autistic? Because that's not what you asked me actually, right? So, so, so because um, the, uh, 
the medical model is the way that it is. Like we also need to find a diagnostician who is neurodiversity affirming, right? Because otherwise it's not that helpful to have an interaction with a professional who sees your child through a deficit-based lens, right? So that that needs to be true. And then a way of understanding this is how my brain works and this is how my brain's needs are. And then, you know, that's, I think, I, I think that that's how I might answer that question. Martha, then Amanda, then I think we need to wrap up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. good. My issue is noise and unnecessary noise. For example, in the grocery store, they have always upbeat, pumpy, bouncy music with lots of words. It's very distracting. And for an ADHD autistic like me, grocery shopping is a fucking hell, pardon my French. And restaurants are similar. They have all kinds of stuff coming at you, music and TV and whatnot. And even eating in a restaurant by myself is intolerable. But to go out to a restaurant with somebody else, forget about it. And when I question, why do they impose this stuff on us? The answer I get, it's a corporate decision. And further research reveals that these businesses apparently find that they move merchandise or move customers out in the case of a restaurant based on imposing this sensory overload. And it, at some point during the presentation, it was mentioned, I think something to the effect of that making the changes that help neurodivergent people feel better actually is better for everybody. And even stuff like leaf blowers and wood chippers and all of that. I mean, if I complain about that kind of stuff on next door, I don't know if you guys are familiar with next door, I get shat upon by people because those whose brains can screen out that noise or those to whom those sounds don't feel like a dental drill in the brain, they don't get it. And they think that people that complain about noise are cranks and they shut them down. And I, I, I'm kind of venting here a little bit, but is there any possibility that unnecessary noise can somehow be eliminated because studies show that everybody benefits from not being ground with noise. So I just wonder if you would comment on that. I mean, I, I, I'll I also share, I'm gonna share a resource. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe Lizzie or Sarah could find it faster than I can like search and talk about two things at the same time. My brain can't do that. I'm looking for the sensory trauma book. A link to the sensory trauma book. If someone can, someone can do yeah, that. I love up. it. Um, Somebody could pop that in the chat. I yeah, we're going to pop that in the chat. Yeah. So, so uh, it's, a it's, 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 a couple people are putting in about loop earplugs and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, why should I have to take extra measures? You know, that that's the part, it, that's the injustice. Okay, so I'll be quiet and let the next person talk. Thank no, you. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I could not agree with you more. I mean, it's really, it's, it's kind of like, you know, um, the idea of, you know, we, in, in many healthcare facilities, it's, 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 I think pretty mainstream to like not have strong fragrances in a healthcare facility, right? So, so I think, you know, I, I think more and more people are talking about their brains and their needs. And I think that, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful um, that there will be a time in the near future um, where it will be, where, where you won't get the, you know, the, the, the clobber from your next door colleagues um, uh, because it'll just be, yeah. Um, sensory trauma book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the book, Darren. Thank you. I think that's the book. Maybe that's the book. Hold on. That doesn't look like the book. Lizzie, Lizzie, put yeah, that's the book. In the chat. That's the book. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. Cool. That's great. Awesome. Great. Okay, Amanda, you gonna wrap us up? Yes. Uh, hopefully, I can keep this brief. Um, I'm recently diagnosed in the last month. That's been like 
a whirlwind. Um, my son was diagnosed first, um, and I found an autistic practitioner who diagnosed me, which I was like so grateful. But my problem I'm running into is the medical community. Um, I'm in Tennessee, you know, in Nashville, and I think most people would benefit from this information, or most practitioners if they knew, but I was just wondering um, if you have an approach or something on, because I've been treated like an addict when I've had chronic pain and, you know, and, and turned away. My son is dealing with a lot of issues and fibromyalgia and all, but I can't get anyone to listen to me. It's just going to all these specialists and waiting. Um, and I'm I'm losing my faith in the medical community that they won't listen. So is there approach? Because then I go in there emotional because I'm an emotional autist. <laughs> so I'm all worked up and over censored and all of that. So is there a recommendation of how to approach this with a practitioner to find the right person to manage the yeah. care? Yeah. So I think I have two ways that I want to respond to this. Um, so first off, I just want to like, recognize and validate like just how awful it is what you're going through like like this is this is what goes on for our people right like this is and, it, and it's awful it's just it's awful it's exactly it's exactly what this is all about right so so I would say that um one thing that's really important is that when you know when you are empowered you know what's going on for yourself um, my hope for you is that this can, can, can insulate you from harm of being gaslit because you can't be gaslit if you don't believe it. Right. So, so you have, you know, if you, if you have this constellation of intertwined medical problems, um, it's not a thing we made up. It's a thing in the literature. It's a thing that happens to autistic people. And now you have an autism diagnosis. So, you know, this is this, in, in our medical practice, 97% of our autistic adults have this. Yeah. So what I would do is I would go to on, on the everything's connected to everything project site. I would go to the patient resources and I would click on the letter on the right hand side. It's a letter to bring to your primary care clinician. I print it out and say, hey, I just learned I'm autistic. Can you read this letter and say nothing else? We have learned that that is helpful. We've gotten good feedback from, you know, people on social media that this this actually works the way that we've been hoping for which is really awesome which is really really awesome um the um an, another thing that that um you might find interesting um last month we did a panel at brain club um where it was a panel of primary care clinicians from the traditional system who didn't know about this constellation of intertwined medical conditions who learned about this project and they shared reflections on like what it was like to learn about this project. And so um, uh, that might, um, Lizzie, can you pull that one up? The, I think it was the first week in maybe March recording from Brain Club. Okay, all right, so we'll pop that in the chat. Um, because it's 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 really about, um, I, think, I, I think the healthcare system thwarts everybody it thwarts patients for sure, but it also thwarts clinicians. And so when clinicians don't have their access needs met, um, it really interferes with having access to taking in the information in the way that you're throwing it down. And so the idea is not having to contort yourself to communicate in a just so way or like have this strategy um, because um, just let the letter speak for you. Hey, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much um, for for being here tonight, and um, we we hope we hope that you'll stay connected.
Have a good night.